Welcome to Conversations about North Dakota History. My name is Lou Hoffermel. I'm the director of the Division of Archaeology and Historic Preservation with the State Historical Society of North Dakota. With me this morning is Professor William E. Lass uh, of the uh, Mankato State University, Mankato, Minnesota. Dr. Lass is uh, the author of uh, the definitive work, uh, at this point at least, uh, on uh, uh, steamboating on the Upper Missouri. Uh, he is the author of a work, A History of Steamboating on the Upper Missouri River, published in 1962, I believe, by the University of Nebraska Press. That's right. uh, we're very happy to have you with us this morning, Dr. Lass. Uh, the uh, steamboating on the uh, on the Missouri, uh, the lower Missouri, began, I think, as early as 1819 or 1820. But uh, uh, steamboating on the upper Missouri came somewhat later, and I think was associated primarily or initiated uh, uh, by the fur trade. Uh, Pierre Chateau is a is a name that comes immediately to mind there, and uh, uh, would you? Uh, uh, begin our conversation by commenting on him and his role in the uh, development of steamboating. Well, P Pierre Chateau, Jr. of St. Louis, Missouri, was the third generation of a Chateau trading family. And he happened to be the president of the company that evolved into Pierre Chateau, Jr. and Company in the early 1830s. And at that time, the Chateaus of St. Louis were affiliated with John Jacob Astor's American Fur Company. And in the course of conducting their fur trade on the upper Missouri, they used keel boats, the same type of boat that Lewis and Clark had used mm -hmm. in 1804 and 1805. And the keel boat was a boat that had to be operated manually. That is, they were either sailed or rowed or quite often towed by men mm -hmm. uh, walking in front on a long hawser. Uh, Chateau was intrigued with the idea of using a powered craft, hence a steamboat. And in 1831, uh, in large part at the instigation of Kenneth Mackenzie, the so-called king of the upper Missouri, uh, Chateau was convinced to have a steamboat built with the idea that this would save time and in the business world where time is money, it would be more efficient and uh, save them expense. So uh, in 1831, for the first time, they used a small steamboat, by small I'm speaking here of a craft that was 130 feet long, and attempted to reach the upper Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, they got to a point near present-day Pier, South Dakota. Uh, the next year, 1832, uh, they used the same boat and did manage to reach Fort Union with it, mm -hmm. uh, very close to the present-day North Dakota-Montana border. Mm -hmm. The uh, 1832 and 1833 trips of that particular boat are very well known because uh, the trips included some celebrated passengers mm -hmm. such as the artist uh, Carl Bodmer mm -hmm. uh, who was actually part of a party led by the scientist Maximilian Prince of Vied. Mm -hmm. The artist George Catlin uh, also made the steamboat trip to the upper Missouri and so much of what we know about these trips is based on these uh, highly literate uh, mm -hmm. individuals who publicize them. The uh, 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 a major obstacle uh, that uh, the steamboat trade or traffic had to overcome was the nature of the river itself, which differed so much from the Ohio and the Mississippi, for example. And uh, that gave rise to a different kind of craft, ultimately, altogether. Uh, explain uh, uh, the, uh, the nature of the Missouri a little bit and compare it to those other rivers. Well, I think the outstanding characteristic of the, of the Missouri is that uh, much of the terrain on the upper Missouri was barren by present-day standards. Mm 
If people have an opportunity to look today at the Missouri River, uh, the part of it that is unaffected by dams, mm -hmm. uh, they will tend to see a fair amount of timber along the river. Uh, this is true in that very small portion in North Dakota that's unaffected by dams. It's true of the uh, Missouri and Montana above the Fort Peck Dam, which is unaffected by dams. But those trees that you see today would not have been characteristic, let's say, of the frontier. Mm -hmm. the, uh, when the country was ravaged by prairie fires, there was much, much less timber. Mm -hmm. And so the appearance of the river has changed. And if you had looked at an early scene of the Missouri, uh, such as the one we're looking at here, which was taken in Montana in the late 1870s, essentially you'd have seen a barrenness, an almost badlands type mm -hmm. terrain. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, face of the river has changed in that respect. Uh, probably uh, what impressed people about the upper Missouri more than anything else was its shallowness, uh, a uh, characterized you usually by a lack of water. Uh, so much so that there's the story of the steamboat captain who, while trying to proceed upstream one day, saw an individual come down to the river and take out a bucket of water, whereupon he shouted at him, hey, you put that back. <laughs> and sometimes it was virtually that close. Now, what came out of this? And this did not occur until after roughly uh, 35 to 40 years of experimentation. But ultimately, by the 1870s, a unique type of craft was developed, uh, which came to be known as the mountain boats. Mm -hmm. uh, mountain boats, because if you envision Missouri River navigation, as originally taking place from St. Louis, Missouri, the goal was to reach the head of navigation, Fort Benton, Montana, mm -hmm. which by river was 30 miles downstream from Great Falls, from the Great Falls of the Missouri. Mm -hmm. So as a steamboat ascended the Missouri, literally it would be like going up a winding staircase. You're spiraling up and up in altitude. And during the summer months, uh, when uh, the navigation occurred primarily uh, late spring, early summer, the steamboat people were not always, not, uh, <clears throat> were always conscious of climbing uphill mm -hmm. against the current. And they were also very conscious that they were going north because to these St. Louis people, when they got into uh, present-day North Dakota or present-day Montana, they invariably commented about uh, how long the nights were, uh -huh. how long the evenings were, uh -huh. because they were unaccustomed to those 9 o'clock or 9.30 mm -hmm. sunsets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the practice in steamboating was to navigate during the daylight hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a very generous definition of daylight, actually. It was as soon as they could see in the morning. Uh, quite often by 4.30, 5 o'clock, they'd be moving. And that was, uh, uh, that was a practice that differed from the, uh, the practice on eastern uh, rivers. Is that not correct? Well, uh, very often on the Mississippi River, where they had a deep, safe channel, uh, they would tend to cruise at night. Mm -hmm. uh, as a general practice on the Missouri River, they did not navigate at night. Mm -hmm. uh, the only nights they would attempt to move would be nights in which there was a full moon or something very close to a full moon mm -hmm. because they had, because of the shallowness of the river, they had to be very concerned about sandbars. Mm -hmm. They had to be very concerned about snags and so they are adapting their practice to the river. Now, considerably later, by, say, 1885, when steamboating was clearly in its death throes on the upper Missouri, mm -hmm. then they introduced on the steamboats searchlights, uh -huh. ele electric-powered searchlights. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, they're carrying their own generators and making their own electricity. Well, that changed the nature of it somewhat.
But if you're thinking of it in that pre-searchlight period, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, with the exception of the full moon nights, mm -hmm. yes, it was a daytime activity. And I don't mean to say that they could always operate during the day. Uh, anyone who's familiar with the upper Missouri region is very familiar with the uh, sweeping winds. Yes. And so uh, the winds tended to uh, intensify in the river valley since it was low. And quite often, a boat could be blown on a sandbar. If you had something yes. like a 40 or 50 mile an hour wind, you would not have the control with a steamboat, say, that you'd have with a present day vehicle. Mm -hmm. You have a big wheel, you have a craft that comes about very slowly, mm -hmm. and it really couldn't be likened to anything we know today mm -hmm. by way of river craft. Mm -hmm. And uh, a side wind on a steamboat would make it virtually uncontrollable. Yes. So there were whole days where they didn't move. They'd, mm -hmm. they'd tie up mm -hmm. and wait for the wind to go down. The, uh, this this um, uh, characteristic of the uh, windy uh, conditions on the northern plains uh, contributed to the design of the boat, uh, although they could never overcome apparently the, uh, the problems uh, they had to confront with those strong winds. It, it did influence the uh, boat design. Can you, can you uh, talk a bit about uh, the evolution of that design? Well, uh, f first of all, the, uh, the boats that were built specifically for the upper Missouri were usually built in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. Mm -hmm. uh, the craft of boat building was never extended to the Missouri River. So these are boats built in the Pittsburgh area. Sometimes they were built uh, at other Ohio River ports, such as Evansville, Indiana. Mm -hmm. But the reason for Pittsburgh is that it was in the Pittsburgh area where you had your concentration of craftsmen. Mm -hmm. uh, who could not only design boats, but who had appropriate aged material and who could actually finish boats. Uh, the boat builders, while they wanted something utilitarian, they also wanted something that had a certain aestheticness to it. Sure. And so they always made much of finishing off the boat with a, uh, a ship's chandler. And in Pittsburgh, there were specific chandlery businesses. Mm -hmm. There were specific businesses that would make steamboat parts. So if you have a steamboat engine, and that engine is driven by a piston, then obviously that piston had to be very carefully made, and it had to be made according to specifications and the housing for the engine would have to be made according to certain metallic special, uh, specifications. Mm -hmm. And so it, it took a great deal of background uh, to do that. And then, too, in designing the boats, uh, faced with the shallowness of the upper Missouri, what they really wanted to do is to have a boat that would carry as much tonnage as possible on as little water as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a, uh, a goal, and uh, it was really a very common saying, not only on the Missouri, but also on the Ohio River and the upper Mississippi. The boat builders wanted to design a boat that would sail on a heavy dew, mm -hmm. as they put it. Mm -hmm. And there were times when they had boats as much as 200 feet long, that when empty, and of course there's always some question as to what an empty boat does mm -hmm. for you, but at least it's a starting point, that they design these things that when empty, they draw only about a foot and a half of water. I, I, recall, I don't recall the name of the boat, but uh, uh, mention in your uh, uh, book of, uh, of uh, uh, a boat constructed late in the uh, steamboating era on the Missouri that I think drew 14 inches? I think it's the one we see here. The uh, F.Y. Bachelor was built at Pittsburgh in uh, 1879, actually, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and uh, was a rather well-known boat. Uh, 
because it was built as a family venture. Uh -huh. And during its maiden voyage, actually made the trip from Pittsburgh to Fort Benton. If you can imagine going by water from western Pennsylvania to Fort Benton, Montana. Which in river miles would have been perhaps 4,000 miles? Uh, approximately 4,000 miles because steamboat people reckoned the St. Louis to Fort Benton distance as 3,100 miles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, if you look up the distances of the Missouri River, it's approximately 900 miles less than that. Uh -huh. But as the steamboat people said, they they measured the way the boats went. Right. They went by the sinuosities of the stream. Right. But if you look at uh, what you might regard as relatively typical mountain boats, uh, some of the characteristics that stand out on them is uh, boats that were quite broad relative to their length. Mm -hmm. So most of the mountain boats would have been in the 190 to 200 feet length range. Mm -hmm. With that length, they would have had a breadth or a width of approximately 34 to 35 feet. Mm -hmm. So roughly a sixth width in proportion to the length. And uh, the bottom would have been flat and the uh, bottom, and for that matter, the rest of the boat, would have been made out of relatively light material. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine a boat that big and the bottom planks on it would be, say, typically 2 by 12s uh, made out usually out of pine, uh -huh. out of dried pine. Uh, if they had used, uh, oh, let's say oak, that had a thickness of uh, four to six inches, they'd have had much safer boats. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they would have drawn much more. Yes. And so the tendency was to make these things out of light, weak mm -hmm. wood, mm -hmm. which is part of the reason they wrecked so easily. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, look at the designs of the boats, in this case here, where you see the rosebud under steam on the Missouri River, an outstanding characteristic of the boats. If you'd look at that particular picture where the bow of the boat meets the water, mm -hmm. the front is curved and it's low in the water. Uh, what was called a spoonbill construction. And the reason for the rounded spoonbill uh, bow on the boats was to enable them to slide up and over shoals. Uh -huh. The uh, upper Missouri, the extreme upper Missouri, approximately 200 miles uh, downstream from Fort Benton, usually had a rocky bottom, mm -hmm. uh, hence the so-called Rocky River. And in that portion of the river, it was very common for steamboat men to encounter what they called bumping. Uh -huh. In other words, the boat is bumping rocky shoals. Uh -huh. And when this occurred, what they wanted was something that would tend to rise up over and the, over the rocky over the shoals. shoals. Mm -hmm. And that rounded front uh, mm -hmm. would accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And then also in designing the boats, uh, to get back to the matter of the prairie wind, uh, notice, in, and the boat pictures show this very well, uh, this one of the rosebud here. Boats that were typically, uh, to use a present day uh, vehicle expression, low profile. Uh -huh. uh, you wanted something that the wind would not buffet. And so a boat like the rosebud here, uh, quite simply has a lower deck, an upper deck, and then a pilot house. Mm -hmm. You contrast that to some of the passenger boats that you'd see on the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. And they were multi-tiered, uh, yes. sometimes four or five decks. Yes. And uh, even the total height of this, uh, the top of the smokestacks that show on the rosebud here, approximately 55 feet from the water level. Mm -hmm. So these tended to be uh, boats that were designed 
for freight purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that respect, they're, they're very utilitarian. Uh, anyone who traveled on uh, an upper Missouri River mountain boat uh, should not have expected uh, even decent passenger accommodations. Uh -huh. uh, most of the time, the only people who had cabins would be the boat officers, and usually uh, 16 to 18 passengers and the rest of the passengers would share the lower deck with uh, the cargo. Mm -hmm. And on the lower deck, uh, of course, you had the uh, steam, you had the furnace, you had the boilers, mm -hmm. you had the steam engine itself, and uh, you had space for people to sleep. And people who booked deck passage got just that. That they got a space on the boat, uh -huh. and there were times when uh, they would cram two to three hundred people on that lower deck, uh -huh. and at night it was uh, uh, roll up on the deck and be sandwiched uh -huh. in between other people. Definitely uh, close on some of those uh, uh, warm uh, very, evenings. Very, very close, <laughs> and uh, of course on the summer nights you'd expect that lower deck. Uh, Typically, they tied up on the bank mm -hmm. next to timber, mm -hmm. and mosquitoes would just swarm onto the boat. And uh, <clears throat> one thing that relatively few passengers commented on, but the, uh, the very uh, primitive toilet conditions. Uh -huh. There would be one toilet, and that was located near the uh, stern, actually mm -hmm. over the paddle mm -hmm. wheel, and that everybody shared. Uh -huh. The, uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, that people tend to uh, forget today when we uh, cross the highway bridges over the Missouri and whatnot is uh, the, the water today, of course, is so very clear. Uh, certainly in the days of the uh, steamboat trade, that was not the case, and that presented major problems for the mechanical operation of the boat from time to uh, time. It presented problems in a lot of ways. The, uh, the river water, the... Uh, well, of course, to the steamboat people, they usually referred to the Missouri as the big muddy. Mm -hmm. uh, the water was characteristically silk-laden, very dirty. Uh, they used that water for uh, toilet purposes. They used it for cooking purposes. Uh, they used it, actually, in the... Uh, the bartender used it to mix drinks, <laughs> and so there were uh, individuals who had some problems with, uh, let's say, whiskey and water, mm -hmm. where it would be uh, river water mixed with the liquor. And the uh, big problem they had from a practical standpoint is that this was the water <coughs> that was used in the boilers. Mm -hmm. And so if you can imagine, uh, a boiler, and usually these boilers were uh, much larger than people would think, uh, quite often 30 to 35 feet in length. Uh -huh. And they'd have a diameter of about three feet. Uh, the reason for the diameter is that it was necessary to clean the boilers periodically. Mm -hmm. Because you can imagine with muddy water, that you're boiling inside of a, a metal container, the mud residue would build up in the boiler. Yes. Uh, the same way today in water you get liming or mm -hmm. you'd get mud if you were using it. And when that uh, mud collected in the boiler, it crusted or baked. Mm -hmm. And so uh, normally about every week, they would have to lay over, and the boilers were designed so an end of them could be unscrewed. Uh -huh. And then they would uh, send somebody in to uh, clean the boilers, mm -hmm. and usually this was a cub engineer, uh, quite often a boy, 15, 16 years old, mm -hmm. and quite often a small boy. Uh -huh. uh, because if you're working with a three-foot diameter, you, sure. you couldn't accommodate a large person. Sure. And very often, this was done on hot, humid days in the closed mm -hmm. conditions. Mm -hmm. And they would simply go in there uh, with a scraper, 
and scrape away at that uh, packed mud and then flush it out with uh, hoses. And in the course of a, a course of a trip from uh, St. Louis to Fort Benton, uh, that could occur, uh, that process could occur as many as uh, perhaps eight or ten times, but that was typically... Uh, I, I'd say trip. that would be true because mm -hmm. the, uh, the St. Louis to Fort Benton trips in the late 1860s, early 1870s, uh, very often took about 60 days. Uh -huh. It was about approximately a two-month trip. Lengthy trip. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, what are the uh, uh, boats uh, that we're looking at here? Okay, the two boats we're looking at here are um, two of the best-known boats that operated out of Bismarck in the mid to late 1870s, the uh, Far West and the Nelly Peck. Mm -hmm. The uh, <coughs> Far West was probably the single best known steamboat on the upper Missouri mm -hmm. because it is the boat that Captain Grant Marsh used to evacuate wounded yeah. after the uh, Custer yes. incident in Montana, the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And uh, <clears throat> the other boat, the Nellie Peck, was operated by the Peck Line and one of the patterns in steamboat naming in its own sense is rather interesting. The uh, Colson Line, which was based at Yankton, Dakota mm -hmm. Territory, present day Yankton, South Dakota, had a reputation for having boats that always had names with seven letters. Uh -huh. So it's such names as the Far West, the Red Bud, uh, Red, mm -hmm. <laughs> Rosebud rather, uh, the Montana, the Wyoming, uh, the Dakota, uh -huh. but Dakota, T-A-H, uh -huh. so it came out of seven letters. And the tradition among the steamboat people was that one of the partners in the Coulson line was superstitious. Uh -huh. And so all of the names had to have seven letters. Uh, another fairly common pattern of boat naming was to name it after women members of the family. Mm -hmm. So you will get such boats as this one here, the Nellie Nelly Peck, Peck. Mm -hmm. uh, the Katie Kuntz, mm -hmm. the Florence Meyer, uh -huh. this type of thing. Frequently, uh, as I understand, uh, the uh, wives of, uh, of uh, captains or uh, operators in the business uh, were part owners of boats. Um, uh, and uh, they spread the ownership uh, of these craft out for a particular reason, and I think that says something very important about the nature of that, that trade. Could you expand on that? Uh, yes. Uh, the boats that you're looking at here, the Far West and the Nellie Peck, were uh, both built in the mid-1870s. The cost of a single boat like this it varied a little bit depending on how they, they finished them off in terms of the uh, chandlery and the like. But normally the cost would be about $24,000. But this is $24,000 in an economy where, say, a laborer was paid a dollar a day. Mm -hmm. So if you think of hourly wages as being something like 12 or 15 cents an hour, or it's in an economy where bacon would sell for a nickel a pound. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> a very substantial and amount. And so of money. it's a great okay. amount of money, Certainly. actually, mm -hmm. in that economy. Usually, with an investment of the uh, $24,000, it would not be possible for boat owners to obtain insurance from a single company. Uh -huh. If they did obtain insurance, it was normally done through an underwriting process. They would contract with uh, an underwriter who would obtain insurance from as many as seven or eight different companies mm -hmm. who might cover a liability of each. They'd cover a liability of $2,000 or $3,000. Mm -hmm. And then the premiums on that insurance would typically cost 10% of the boat's value. Uh -huh. So if you're saying a $24,000 boat, then each year you're talking about $2,400 in premiums. Yeah. 
And so usually the boats were insured at less than full value. Mm -hmm. So if you take something like the Coulson line, which usually had a fleet of six to seven boats, uh, they would involve everybody in the company would be involved in the ownership of a piece of each one. Uh -huh. And so no one individual would own a boat totally. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that ownership was extended to the point where an individual would have a one thirty second interest mm -hmm. in a boat. Mm -hmm. So if the boat's lost, it's a way of distributing the liability. Sure, is, sure. Uh, spread the, the risk, really. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, they were actually in a risky business. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for the, uh, for the risk uh, was the, the fragile construction of the boats. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it, too, uh, was the delays in delivering cargo. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when they uh, had government contracts, contracts with the Army, uh, contracts with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. There would be penalties built into the contracts if they did not deliver a specified percentage of the goods by a particular date. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they were very conscious of delays. Yes. And if you uh, <clears throat> look at the pictures here of the Far West and the Nellie Peck, uh, notice in the front part of the boats another thing that was very characteristic of upper Missouri uh, steamboats. You see on uh, both sides of the bow spars mm -hmm. uh, ahead of the smokestacks. And it might look uh, casually that those spars were there for the purpose of helping to load the boat. Mm -hmm. uh, this was not the case at all. Uh, they were colloquially known as grasshopper poles uh -huh. because if the boat uh, was hung up on a sandbar, uh, those poles were swiveled at deck level. They could be dropped over the front of the boat and planted in the sandbar. Mm -hmm. And then at running through the pulleys on the poles were cables that led to a small steam engine that was mounted actually below the floorboards in the bow. Uh -huh. And this steam engine operated a uh, small winch that would take up the cable mm -hmm. as it turned, a, a turnstile that would take up the cable. As it took up the cable, assuming the spars did not break. Mm -hmm. And let me say that this happened mm -hmm. more often than not, because you're dealing with two rather spindly pieces of wood there. Yes. So if you assume the spars would not break, then the effect of taking up the cable would be to lift the boat. You'd mm -hmm. literally jack the boat up. Mm -hmm. And as you jacked it up and the cable became tighter and tighter, then the boat, in effect, would fall forward mm -hmm. over the spars. Mm -hmm. And every time you went through that process, uh, you could gain six or eight feet. Uh -huh. And it might take a day or sometimes two days, but you could grasshopper your way yes. off sandbars. Yes. And, and that's the reason for the poles. Uh, I recall uh, your account of uh, one captain that used a different technique. I think a large chain uh, to uh, uh, which uh, three men on either side would uh, uh, would attach themselves and uh, dr draw it under the uh, hole, uh, thus loosening the sand. And uh, I will have to say I found only one record of Is that. Is there? <laughs> and uh, this was actually from a. Uh, rather embittered individual uh -huh. who booked passage from Fort Benton, Montana. Uh -huh. And then uh, when they would get delayed on the shallow river, all the passengers would have to get off and walk uh -huh. uh, to lighten the load on the boat. And then in the case of this one particular sandbar, uh, the captain did have them get out and do sort of a tug of war with a heavy chain uh -huh. with the idea of loosening the sand under the boat and replacing the sand with water. And actually, for a nearly empty boat, uh, 
uh, that's flat bottomed. It wouldn't mm -hmm. take much water mm -hmm. to give the necessary buoyancy, mm -hmm. and that's what he was mm -hmm. he was trying to accomplish. Uh, they did have another method of getting uh, boats off sandbars. It again involved that small steam engine mm -hmm. in the front, and that would be to uh, use what they called a dead man, which consisted of taking normally a huge cottonwood log, uh -huh. uh, burying it in a trench, either at the end of the sandbar or on shore, and then running a cable from that little steam engine to the dead man, mm -hmm. and then taking up the line. Mm -hmm. And quite often this would work. If the log was buried, uh, the <clears throat> resistance provided mm -hmm. by the log in the trench mm -hmm. would be sufficient to pull the steamboat off. Mm -hmm. They did have to be conscious when they did that, though, of um, punching holes mm -hmm. in the bottoms of the boats, mm -hmm. uh, because they're, they're really very fragile. And uh, in this particular case here, uh, you see a uh, close-up of the steamer Helena. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, at the Bismarck landing, uh, this happened to be in uh, 1884, when the Helena was being used as a ferry boat. Uh -huh. That's why you see so many people on there. Yes. It's hardly a typical passenger yes. situation. Mm -hmm. But it's a rather good mm -hmm. view of the close-up of the boat. Mm -hmm. And if you look closely at the picture, uh, you can see something of the rickety nature of those boats. Mm -hmm. Notice the railing on the upper deck. Uh, rather much undulates, it's hardly secure. Yes. And notice, too, that on the lower deck, uh, you simply do not have a railing. Mm -hmm. So for individuals on uh, a steamboat, it behooved them to stay away from the water's edge uh -huh. and uh, above all else to stay sober. And for heaven's sakes, don't walk uh, on something that had spray on it, or you could end up in the river. In the river, uh, yeah. There was, a <clears throat> there was a hazard here. And then <clears throat> if you look at uh, uh, this particular view here, you get a very good close-up view of those spar poles mm -hmm. in front, the mm -hmm. grasshopper poles. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> this boat, uh, again, is the Helena, a... Uh, a boat owned by the uh, Fort Benton Transportation Company, or the power line. That's why you see between the smokestacks the uh, Block P logo, mm -hmm. uh, P for Thomas Power and his brother John. And uh, this, this craft was uh, actually their second boat. Uh, the Powers wanted to publicize Montana a mm -hmm. great deal. Mm -hmm. So when they built their first boat, or had their first boat built in 1875, they named it the Benton, after Fort Benton. Uh -huh. The second boat they named the Helena, mm -hmm. after the capital of Montana. Mm -hmm. Their third boat they named the Butte, mm -hmm. after Butte, Montana. <laughs> And they, they used this actually as a form of advertising for their territory mm -hmm. uh, through the boat names. The uh, preceding uh, slide uh, was uh, interesting. It pointed out a kind of irony about, the, uh, about uh, steamboating on the Missouri, I think, and that is that as the railroads progressed, established new railheads along the Missouri, uh, towns, uh, in terms of the steamboat trade as well as the railroad trade, of course, would uh, would flourish. But uh, as soon as a new point had been established further north on the river, the uh, importance of uh, of the community would uh, pass away. As a uh, uh, yes, it's uh, it's a major consideration to uh, <clears throat> that has to be taken into account in steamboating. Mm -hmm. uh, conventional wisdom has it that railroads, of course, uh, economically kill steamboating. Uh, what is not so well recognized, and one of the things I have concentrated on in my studies, is that there was a period of time where you had railroad steamboat cooperation, mm -hmm. because railroads would be built to a particular point on the river, yes. and hence a railhead would be established. Uh, Bismarck is actually the classic case in point, because the Northern Pacific, 
reached Bismarck in the spring of 1873. Mm -hmm. Later that year, the Panic of 1873, which was followed by a very prolonged depression, mm -hmm. set in. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the Northern Pacific Railroad was not extended west of the Missouri River for six more years. Yes. So for six years, Bismarck was the end of the track. Mm -hmm. And in actuality, when you consider the route of the Northern Pacific, from Bismarck to Dickinson to Glendive and Miles City in Montana, until the Northern Pacific reached Glendive in 1881, mm -hmm. Bismarck would be the end of track mm -hmm. for all practical purposes. Mm -hmm. And so all of the commerce that flowed from the Twin Cities area of Minnesota towards Montana mm -hmm. came by rail to Bismarck mm -hmm. and then was transshipped by steamboat. Mm -hmm. And in this particular picture here, you of course see the meeting of the technologies. Uh, the railroad bridge there was completed at Bismarck in 1883. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to 1883, say after 1879, when tracks started to be laid west of the Missouri River, steamboats played a hand in railroad construction. Yes. Uh, during the winter months, the railroad would lay track on the ice at Bismarck and they'd use uh, uh, nature's bridge, mm -hmm. the uh, track on the ice. During the summer months, they used uh, specially designed steamboats. Uh, the steamboats that we have been looking at here, the typical mountain boats, were all stern wheelers. Mm -hmm. A single wheel at the end, yes. at the start. And the reason for this is that there were so many embedded trees or snags in the Missouri mm -hmm. that uh, such a boat usually would not get those trees entangled in the wheel the way a side wheeler would. Mm -hmm. But the Northern Pacific Railroad had two special boats built that uh, were referred to as transfer boats. Uh -huh. They were both side wheelers. And the reason for it was that both ends of the boat, bow and stern, mm -hmm. were open. Mm -hmm. And what ran down the middle of the boat was a railroad track. Yes. And by backing such a boat up, say on the east bank at Bismarck, the Northern Pacific could run on six railroad cars, mm -hmm. take the boat directly across the river to Mandan, mm -hmm. and run them off on the track. Mm -hmm. And this, these were the famous transfer boats. Uh -huh. But then after the bridge was completed in 1883, uh, then obviously there's no need for yes. the transfer boats. Yes. And the uh, the bridge did create a great many problems because uh, usually on the Missouri River, when the river was moving rapidly, you tended to get eddies of water, swirling water, a, a whirlpool type action around those bridge piers. Yes. And that was quite a hazard for the, steamboats. The uh the, uh, I, I believe it was the Colson line that uh, constructed toward the end of the uh, steamboating era on the Missouri, the largest uh, of, the, uh, of the mountain steamers. And uh, I believe two of those had major problems uh, with bridges uh, on the southern portion of the river. Yeah, the, uh, the boats that uh, you're mentioning here, uh, Colson in 1879, for some reason of his own, no one has really been able to understand this, mm -hmm. had three extra large boats built, the Montana, the Dakota, and the Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And those boats were uh, all about 250 feet long, so they're mm -hmm. a fifth again as long mm -hmm. as the typical mountain boat. And they had a breadth of uh, nearly 50 feet. Uh -huh. uh, they could carry, when loaded, approximately 600 tons. Uh -huh. And uh, just uh, whether he thought that someday the Missouri would uh, uh, 
be ripe for a lively passenger trade? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, usually the boats could not be loaded mm -hmm. fully to capacity. And in all cases, they were uh, they tended to be accident prone, mm -hmm. uh, very much so. It's almost as if they were fated. Mm -hmm. And so if you uh, look at some of the hazards of navigation on the, uh, <coughs> on the Missouri, uh, the sort of thing that was involved, this happens to be the uh, wreck of the Montana. Uh, mm -hmm. During its first season, it was docked at Bismarck briefly and apparently was hit by either a uh, very strong straight wind or a small tornado uh -huh. and virtually wrecked. And you can see timber scattered around and the pilot house down. The boat was rebuilt and then two years later hit a bridge pier at uh, near present-day Kansas, Kansas City. City. Uh -huh. uh, Colson took the boats and sent them to the l lower Mississippi mm -hmm. to operate in the cotton trade mm -hmm. during the winter months. And uh, this, this boat was wrecked. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, uh, so were the Dakota mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and the Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Now, another problem that uh, upper Missouri steamboat men had in the days before railroads reached the upper Missouri, which would have been in the case of Sioux City pre-1868, mm -hmm. uh, with Yankton and Bismarck pre-1873, mm -hmm. invariably the boats were wintered at St. Louis or were used on the lower Mississippi. After railheads reached Yankton and Bismarck, then the tendency was to keep most of the boats on the upper Missouri during the winter months mm -hmm. uh, on uh, specially constructed steamboat ways, uh, which meant that they were pulled up on the banks and mm -hmm. uh, rested on winter supports over the winter. In 1881, uh, all of the Colson line boats were on ways at Yankton. Uh -huh. when the great ice jam occurred uh -huh. in the flood of 1881. And here you see uh, two boats. Well, one of them's the power line boat, the Helena. Mm -hmm. uh, the Helena and the Western were on the ways at Yankton when the ice jam moved in. So most of what you see in the foreground is huge blocks of ice. Mm -hmm. And those boats were just crushed like you might crush mm -hmm. a little wooden box. Mm -hmm. And this is much of what uh, caused the Colson line to reassess its position on the upper Missouri. Mm -hmm. And those boats were not rebuilt. And within uh, two years, uh, Colson had decided to get out of steamboating and uh -huh. uh, go into safer things, uh, banking, uh -huh. farming, uh -huh. some ranching. One of the uh, characteristics of the trade on the Upper Missouri, uh, you pointed out, is uh, that uh, when, uh, particularly I believe, when Yankton and Bismarck were established as main uh, uh, primary shipping points along the river, that uh, the boat owners and captains and whatnot became more personally involved in, uh, in their communities, uh, generally resided in, uh, in the communities and whatnot. Which... Oh, uh, very much so. Uh, when Yankton and Bismarck became steamboat ports, then in those communities you had a build-up of what you might think of as the steamboat fraternity. Yes. And so the steamboat captains and the steamboat pilots uh, became, they were local people. Uh, their families tended to uh, live there at least during the navigation season. And in the case of Colson and his associates, who were originally all from the Pittsburgh area, uh, they moved to Missouri River towns. They brought their families. The uh, best known individual uh, in Bismarck's history for steamboating purposes was a Pennsylvanian by the name of uh, Daniel W. Murata. Mm -hmm. uh, he always preferred to be called D.W. Murata. Mm -hmm. uh, the D.W. stood for Daniel Webster. Uh -huh. But since he was active in Democratic Party politics and apparently didn't uh, share his uh, 
parents' fondness for Daniel <laughs> Webster. <laughs> he uh, insisted on being called D.W. Mm -hmm. But in Murata's case, you'll find a person that when he left steam boating in 1884, uh, he was soon named the uh, Marshal of Dakota Territory, uh -huh. in part because he'd been active in Democratic Party politics. politics. Uh -huh. And then uh, he was removed, of course, when the uh, Republicans won the presidency in 1888. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1892, when Grover Cleveland won again, uh, then you will find Maratha being sent to Melbourne, Australia, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. the uh, consul, the American consul general mm -hmm. at Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain tendency to think of these steamboat people as maybe being rather uh, crusty sorts who were tied to the river. But a lot of them in their day and age uh, were really regarded as top level businessmen, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. Businessmen and and uh, that they had no difficulty getting out of steamboating mm -hmm. and moving into other things mm -hmm. where they could use their talents. The uh, political connections uh, are, are, are interesting. Uh, there was obviously a great deal of uh, lobbying for government contracts and uh, and uh, transport of annuities to uh, the reservations on the Upper Missouri and whatnot that really accounted for a very substantial portion of the trade. So they uh, they were very active in uh, lobbying efforts. Yeah, the uh, the government contracts came primarily in two forms. There would be the contracts to supply the army, mm -hmm. and then the contracts to supply the Indian service. And in both cases, when the government let those contracts, they were annual contracts for the entire Upper Missouri area. Mm -hmm. And a company, they had to bid on the contracts. There was a competitive bidding process. But the company that won the bid and was awarded the annual contract basically was given a monopoly of the Army's business for a year. For a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the contracts were let competitively, but there was always the qualification that the successful bidder had to be able to prove a certain ability to carry out the contract. Mm -hmm. So there were times when you would have individuals bid on the contract, and they did not own sufficient boats to mm -hmm. carry out the contract. Mm -hmm. If they could convince the military that they would sublet with other people, then the Army might say, fine, we'll give you the contract. But uh, the Army, especially during the military crisis of uh, 1876, mm -hmm. after the Battle of the Little Bighorn, the Army of the United States was understandably embarrassed. Yes. And so immediately, the decision was made to fortify the Yellowstone River Valley. Mm -hmm. And you then think in terms of rushing new troops into the Yellowstone River Valley and building two forts. Yes. Well, to build those two forts, uh, they brought in approximately 500 civilian workers from mm -hmm. Minnesota, from mm -hmm. the St. Paul, Minneapolis area. Uh -huh. And it was uh, necessary to take into Montana not only those 500 men, but uh, such things as cut lumber. So you'll find railroad car after railroad car of cut yes. lumber yes. Uh, coming to Bismarck. Uh, sometimes 20 to 25 mm -hmm. railroad cars of lumber to mm -hmm. load onto a single steamboat. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> if you're rushing those then into the Yellowstone River Valley, the Army was always concerned about, let's have a company that can deliver. And this is when they turned invariably to the Colson line. Uh -huh. uh, Colson, uh, uh, Sanford B. Colson, the president of the line, uh, had a nice little motto, uh, old reliable line. Old reliable line. And yes. they, they, they put this on their letterhead and they put it in the, uh, on the memos in the dining saloon and they advertised themselves widely that way. But on the side, uh, Colson and his principal, Lieutenant Murata, mm -hmm. uh, were very active in Democratic Party politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one noteworthy incident 
in 1878 where they were outbid for the contract and they used their political influence with members of Congress to have the decision reversed yeah, to get yes. to get the, to get yes. the contract yes. yeah and uh, so uh, uh, there's a there's a political aspect to it mm -hmm. and these were people who uh, uh, they cultivated Mm -hmm. uh, their government connections. Mm -hmm. And so you will find uh, Sanford Coulson, while he normally did not uh, take an active role in traveling in the boats, mm -hmm. if you uh, had someone like uh, the Army Commander William Sherman come out mm -hmm. to inspect the Yellowstone River area mm -hmm. in 1877, well, Coulson is there to meet Sherman, yes. and he's going to travel with him. And Sherman, by the same token, had to convince the politicians that he was taking appropriate measures to quell the Indians. And so he found it convenient to say, I am dealing with the most reliable steamboat yes. company, and I know um, Sanford Coulson was uh, always known as Commodore Coulson. Yes. There, there were certain individuals who had the designation of Commodore. Mm -hmm and he was one, uh, actually a rather uh, aloof individual. Mm -hmm. And so some of his critics referred to him as the Napoleon of the Big Muddy, mm -hmm. that, that he was uh, an emperor within a rather small realm. Yes. He, he was a, a steamboat captain himself. I believe he uh, established a record for a run between... Uh, Sioux, City uh, Sioux City and City Fort Benton. And Fort yeah. Benton. yeah, he was very successful mm -hmm. as a practical navigator and had started out as an engineer and then had moved into a, a captaincy and apparently an individual who was very proficient in a uh, in a mechanical sense yes. uh, uh, he could deal with steamboat engines and mm -hmm. uh, you think in terms of uh, well what does this mean but uh, suppose you have a cylinder say that uh, is faulty and you're on the upper Missouri, and, yes. uh, you can send back to Pittsburgh and say send us out another piston and you can give the specifications for it, but you've got to have somebody there who knows how to put it in. Yes. Or if you break a spar while grasshoppering off a sandbar, obviously you need somebody who can go on shore, cut a spar, install the spar and, mm -hmm. and uh, make that part mm -hmm. work again. Now, uh, one of the things that happened, of course, with steamboating is that really in the early 1880s, as railroads are first of all pushed into the uh, Yellowstone River area, the old mountain boats, as they were wrecked or wore out, were generally replaced by smaller steamboats, yes. uh, such as the one you uh, see here. Mm -hmm. uh, this unfortunate craft, uh, has the interesting name of Excelsior, uh -huh. but uh, unlike the Excelsior of the poem, it was hardly soaring onward and upward. <laughs> it's hung up on a sandbar yeah, in at the Yellowstone least, River. Yeah. <laughs> and there you see a fairly typical river scene of a boat that's on a sandbar. Mm -hmm. And these later boats did not have grasshopper poles. Mm -hmm. So until the water rises, or until you dug the sand out from under it, or until you towed it off with another boat, uh, it's going to be there. You were stuck. And mm -hmm. then from time to time, we've been referring to hazards of the Missouri. Uh, this happens to be not a photograph, but a photograph of a painting. Uh, Carl Bodmer's rendering of the Yellowstone coming up the Missouri. Mm -hmm. And you get a fairly good representation of snags, large trees, with the root embedded in the river. Mm -hmm. And the current then would cause them to point downstream, and the current would also break off the tops. Mm -hmm. So they'd be sticking up out of the water downstream like so many large swords. Mm -hmm. And many of these were broken off just below the surface. Uh -huh. So you can imagine a broken oh, tree trunk mm -hmm. that sharpened on the end Yes. in dark water. Mm -hmm. We've been speaking this morning with Dr. William E. Last, 
professor of history at Mankato State University. Thank you very much, Dr. Lass, for being with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.